John Doyle, how are you? I'm doing well. <laughs> a special, special occasion here, just you and I. I thought we'd really spend some uh, bonding time together. Um, I don't know if you've seen, I've been doing a lot of, uh, a lot of journalisming on college campuses lately, and I was thinking, I want to get the full perspective here, and I want to help understand the college youth, and who better than 2022's biggest philosopher, John Doyle, yeah, I mean, you're you're entirely correct that there's no better person to interview on this subject than uh, me as a college dropout. So yeah, I'm right. more than happy to uh, give my theory as to what it is. I think it's probably two things. I think with kids who are maybe more in the center, uh, who are maybe more unwilling to want to participate in these state-sanctioned religious rituals, which is what they are, but they kind of have to because we've structured the economy in sort of the way that we tell kids about their future such that they literally do not believe that there's any path that they can pursue other than getting a college education. I think this is probably even more so the case uh, up in the north there, Guy. But even where we are, you know, people really believe, the average high schooler believes that they are going to have to go to college immediately following high school. And so they often just think to themselves, well, you know, I kind of enjoyed my psychology class or I kind of enjoyed my biology class. So I guess now I have to go get a four-year degree that's going to cost tens of thousands of dollars in whatever field most closely aligns with what I like vaguely had fun doing while I was in high school. So I think that's probably part of it. It's sort of like they don't have any other options uh, that they're aware of. I think the second part of it is that there's no real notion of identity amongst young people. Uh, we've virtually had all of our identities that we could be um, feeling as though we are aligned with stripped away from us systematically through the public education system and reinforced by the media narrative. So people don't identify anymore with their faith, with their family, with their nation, anything. And so the only identity that we really have that can still hold us all together is that we're all citizens of the globalist American empire. And so you, you know, display that identity by going along with the narratives. That is how virtue is defined. So the way that like a devout Catholic would display their identity by coming to school, for example, with ashes on their forehead, that would be a sign of virtue amongst my faith. Uh, we can't do that anymore. And so, or maybe we do do that, but people don't understand what that means. That's not a currency that is redeemable in the eyes of the public anymore for like, that is what a good person looks like. Now a good person is solely defined by how willing they are to celebrate the rituals of the state. And one of those would be things like, uh, you know, not just getting vaccinated, but wearing, you know, the like, I'm vaccinated, a little, little, you know, sticker, or, you know, the get vaccinated hashtags on social media, wearing the face mask, still doing so in your car, updating your profile picture on social media to a photograph of you in a face mask. Things like this are all meant to say to other people, I am a part of the in-group. I'm a part of the club. I Oh, this is what we're doing, and I'm a team player. But there's no real thought as to what this actually means if that were to be removed. It is like the NPC meme. It is just simply wanting to go along with the trends without giving it actually uh, any, any introspection. Now, let me present an argument to you about the recent student loan forgiveness. As many people might not know, uh, $10,000 forgiven from student loans. Now, of course... The, ge the generic response to that is, um, why do they deserve it? Um, why do other people who have actually paid off their loans or um, worked hard to not have to take out a loan, why do they get punished while other people get rewarded? Because as we both probably know, um, I didn't do what I went to college for first. You said you dropped out. I'd say a good half amount of people don't go through with what they first take in post-secondary school. What about the argument, though? And I like to present this to people as well for things like healthcare. What about the argument that they're blowing hundreds of billions of dollars on Ukraine? They're sending money wherever they want it. Green energy uh, deal here that they've got uh, in, the, in the last bill that was passed. Billions of dollars on that. Can't the government, or in a, a more simple sense, the people, can't the country afford to do this? So what's the argument there? What if somebody was to say to you, well, America has all this money anyways. It's going to blow it in Ukraine or blow it on you know, windmills. Why can't we just, you know, relieve a little bit of the debt for the young people of America? I would actually uh, be inclined to agree with that argument in the way that it's framed. I would only push back in the sense that, you know, it's not really at its at its core an argument about like where money is going to go necessarily because it's all being totally blown. What's more interesting is the conversation as 
why it's being blown. And all of those instances that you named were all examples of the current regime rewarding its friends. And like you said, you know, with the American taxpayer having to foot the bill, punishing the enemies. I mean, the punish uh, the, the enemies of the American system are fundamentally its taxpayers. And I mean by that, the people who are paying, frankly, more into the system than they are taking out of it. And a lot of the people who are going to have their debt forgiven can't exactly fall into that category. And so, yeah, money is being blown. We can't afford it in the sense that like it's being blown anyways. Can we afford it as a country? As in, is this, I don't think so. But yeah, it's all going to be blown anyways. And it's being blown on things like Ukraine, where only 30% of that money is actually going towards its destination. It's being blown by forgiving, you know, the, the debt of like upper middle class Americans and things like that. I think what's a more uh, precise attack on the whole idea first place would be to attack the system of college not to say that it's overpriced which it is because a lot of conservatives want to go after you know the way that the government incentivizes these colleges to inflate their prices by you know guaranteeing the debt or whatever uh, and it's also not to say you know that college in itself is a bad idea because we should be encouraging kids to go into skilled trades or whatever it's the idea that college exists for everybody Having a university degree is no longer an impressive statement. It is quite literally the same as getting a driver's license in the sense that if you show up, pay the fee, and present all of the necessary paperwork, eventually they will give you one. If you look at the average IQ of somebody who held a graduate degree, even as recently as like 30 years ago, it is a whole standard deviation and probably even more than that, I think, higher than what you would have now. And this makes a lot of people uncomfortable because they don't like the idea that intelligence is uh, genetic. They don't like the idea that you can't really just work harder and then achieve anything that you want. Because in a sense, that was the American dream, right? If you work hard, you'll be able to achieve anything you want. That was possible with the class of people that we had 100, 150 years ago. But when you import the third world, the American dream isn't going to really exist in that capacity anymore for a lot of reasons. But so people aren't really comfortable with the fact that college ads that exist now is a way of trying to basically purchase your way out of mediocrity. The same way that, you know, people always say about Catholics, oh, you know, they sold indulgences to try to purchase their way out of damnation. It's the same thing where you have people who are totally unexceptional, totally average, thinking that they can go purchase a degree and all of a sudden they're credentialed and they're experts and they're better than someone like myself, who is a genius, who maybe doesn't have that credential to his name, uh, but it's just not the case. And so I think that there's something that really needs to be addressed there with how we deal with those types of people, because now what we've done is we've cheapened the value of a college degree. You know, it was made illegal, for example, because the greatest predictor of job performance is IQ. And so uh, the college, because they made that illegal, they made it illegal to test for IQ and job applications because that's racist or something. And so then college admissions were sort of used as a proxy for that. But then they started uh, eliminating the standardized testing that was a proxy for the IQ test in getting admission to these colleges. And then you're introducing affirmative action. So now the value of a college degree, <clears throat> even from the most elite institutions, has less practical value than it would have a few decades ago. And so I think that we're going to see the general uh, uh, effectiveness of all of our institutions that these students are flooding into diminish more so than we have already. I think that the value of a college degree in general is going to be you know, less than it already is already. Um, and uh, yeah, I just think that the whole, I, the whole thing is basically a scam to funnel money away from normal Americans into the pockets of uh, the elites. Now, I know in places like Egypt, I've spoken to some people way back in the day doing a video on this. Um, they have the, you know, the free college uh, system there. And the people that I spoke to said that it doesn't work. It makes it so everybody has a useless degree, because even if you have let's what, what's something good that people would would normally think is is a is a great degree let's say you've got some sort of advanced math degree well now you've got twenty thousand people who have it because it's free for them or paid by the government um as opposed to the hundred people who would have had it before so that you've flooded the job market and it doesn't mean anything anymore um and they said you know people will go to college three four five times because it's paid for and the state covers this so it's a huge waste of money do you see the American system or maybe even the Western world system going towards that where it just becomes this unstoppable regime of of money being funneled into these institutions? Or do you think that there's going to be a forced, you know, pendulum swaying back into people not going there and eventually prices going down? Um, or does that or does neither of those happen? Because maybe 
completely industry leaves the United States as it already is um, as, as we speak right now, but does it to an even more insane degree. And there's no need for people to go to, uh, you know, trade schools or anything. And that stuff dries up. Is there what type of future do you think we have here with this situation in the next five to 10 years? I think you're probably going to see it trend towards the value of it as a whole diminishing. Um, what's interesting about the cost of college is that typically people who are more intelligent have more money uh, and it's just sort of the way the cookie crumbles. And so those types of families were able to, and we're also probably planning for the future uh, such that they could send their kids to college. And then there would be instances of truly brilliant kids who just didn't have the means of going to college. And you had for those kids types of scholarships, whether they were academic scholarships or they were uh, scholarships for exceptional tests on or exceptional scores on standardized tests. But now those have really diminished. Like they've done away with standardized testing. They've done away for those types of uh, more merit-based scholarships. And then they are now taking much more into account race and you know socioeconomic status in the sense of race, not in the sense of you know like some poor white kid in Appalachia to really fulfill their admissions. And so this has really stripped away the chance of an exceptional kid in middle America who happens to be white uh, to get into these schools like this and really do something brilliant. And it's given much more opportunity to unexceptional kids to take those scholarships away from them and, and you know, not do something brilliant. And that's what I think is interesting about it. You know, you could have a brilliant person who happens to be interested in something like history, uh, which maybe is not on paper as, you know, good of a degree as something like, you know, biomolecular engineering. But if you have that brilliant person get that degree in history, they are actually going to be able to contribute more to society than an average person who, you know, shows up to class and ends up getting a degree in like biomolecular engineering. It's just the way that, that it, it's going to go. Uh, but now we flooded the market. So you have all of these average people flooding all of these fields. And eventually the ladder is going to have a final run. But I think that it's going to have to reach pretty high. So if you look at the most advanced types of, of fields you can get into with all of these degrees, those are still going to be staffed by relatively competent people. But as the years go by, what we're seeing is more affirmative action type people getting placed into uh, you know, the upper management levels of these things. And we're seeing less overall competence from all of these different fields that we're supposed to be funneling brilliant people into. And I think that that's really the scariest part about what the decline is going to look like. You're going to see all of the most important institutions in America be stocked by the class of people who would typically be employed by the DMV or its adjacent institutions. And that's really not going to be good for us. Well, I see a lot of parallels there between like the Biden administration and the Trudeau administration up here in Canada. Um, it's there's so little. Yeah, laugh it up. There's so little separation between me working at a news company and the actual government. We've got like one layer of nerds away and we see these people all the time in, in both of the major parties here. And like you said, they're not very competent people. They are people who've never held a job outside of politics for the most part. They went to university for something, I don't know, that's that cost them probably 150 grand um, that their parents paid for. And now they're in these political positions and they're not smart people. Now, it took me a, a few years to get to this point where I'm willing to blatantly point out that these are unintelligent people or you know, people who don't actually know what they're doing. They're not capable of coming up with reasonable policy or thinking for themselves. They they're guided by Twitter and what Justin Trudeau and his three other friends tell them. But it's very easy to see what you just pointed out in action uh, from a day to day basis, because it's not, you know, some big government conglomerate. Uh, there's no there's no real think tanks going on up here. I mean, there might be behind the scenes, but what we see from the people to what's being implemented is exactly what they say. You know, a few months earlier, Justin Trudeau says he's going to do something. And so do his little minions and they just do it. It's not good. It's not beneficial to anybody. But my question is, is how much longer can this system last just funneling down or uh, flying down this road where we're just spending these billions of dollars? Because it seems to me, in my opinion, that they're, they're just, you know, funneling as much money as they can to that theirs and them and theirs, I guess the G and jurors before eventually the wheels fall off or they get voted out or something. I mean, the amount that Joe Biden's administration is pumping into Ukraine and pumping into their own pockets and uh, renewable energy sources, stuff that they know doesn't work. We see the, uh, that recent story in Colorado where people's, um, thermostats were locked on them. Now they volunteered for that, but that's just one example. California, 
has uh, has blackouts, and then we see it in Germany and France, of course, and all these European countries that are even further left. Do they keep going until the wheels fall off, or does something in the checks and balances, as it were, in the United States prevent them from doing this all the way until some sort of governmental collapse, do you think? I think they'll probably continue to do it until it reaches an inflection point where the American people can actually take their country back. And I don't mean that in the sense of like some grand uprising. I, I think that the solution will ultimately be political, uh, which, you know, it's, it's a popular thing nowadays to say there is no political solution. It's like <laughs> any solution by definition will be political. Like, I mean, if you install a new government, that is political. Um, but I mean, this is the case throughout history. You know, when you reach the late stage of an empire or a republic or what have you, I mean, the elite class just tries to loot it. You know, they set up vassal states they loot money, they launder money through mm -hmm. there. And so we're not seeing anything, you know, exceptional or unique. And it really is kind of sobering uh, to, to meditate on just how our government works and how everything you see is. And, you know, we know that we do know that if you ask somebody whether that's true, they would say yes. But to really digest that and to understand its implications is a much more uh, sobering thought process than just kind of, of course that happens, you know, you're really understanding what that means. Uh, and I, I couldn't help but think deeply about that as I was watching ba or Brandon, uh, Brandon's recent performance uh, in, uh, in Philadelphia. Special. Yeah, that was special, wasn't it? And look, you know, I think it'll probably get worse before it gets better, as we all know. But I just hope that someone out there is uh, aggregating a list of, you know, these five or seven thousand people who are really responsible for all of this and just knowing that we're not going to let them get away with this. I mean, there's so many more of us than there are of them. And if only five percent of us have the agency and the willpower to bring justice to those people, uh, I think that ultimately we can make America and hey, our brothers to the north there great again. So I'm optimistic. Well, one thing that uh, you had a, a lot of eyes on you for was this drag queen thing. I saw mm. Steven Crowder went to one, or he had undercover people at one recently in a smaller town. I forget the name of it in Texas. Uh, uh, did you see that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And Bryson Gray tells me he's on his way to Texas in the coming months um, to to visit one as well. Uh, do you? What other, let's say, genres of degeneracy we'll go with do you see yourself really wanting to be on the quote unquote front lines and for audio listeners we mean non-violent <laughs> lines um it, do you think this is the most important thing right now obviously it's a gross weird attack on children and any parent who's there i would be like i don't trust you with children if you think this is a good place to take them do you see any other uh metaphorical battlegrounds as imminent as that right now no, I think that probably is the most important. And I mean, even we've been prophesizing this for decades that, you know, eventually they're going to come for the kids and now it's happening and we have no plan. And I went to one of these events back in June, I think, and I, I brought people with me and we tried to uh, attract media attention to it. And then we did. And then there was legislation that was uh, drafted to be introduced to ban these types of events with minors. And I was excited. I was like, okay, this is good. This is the right direction. And then I remember thinking to myself, I pray to God that this is not one of those things that everybody gets excited about for a few for a few days and then it just fizzles out. And then that is precisely what happened. You know, I, I have tried to call in favors. I've tried to follow up. And it's basically, you know, it was all a thing where people were getting angry about it. They were getting attention. And then, you know, we had this legislation drafted and we've heard nothing. And I mean, this is the easiest thing in the world. You're not talking about like fundamentally restructuring tax policy or entitlement <laughs> policy. You're talking about just like making kids unable to be abused by their parents and like groomed by these transvestite strippers but even that like we can't get the ball rolling on and so i've been meaning to set some time aside after i get this next video out to like literally just sit and think to myself about how we could actually go about doing something about this but i just i just don't see it and so you know a lot of people uh they want to go there they want to own them they want to shut them down but like ultimately, they're just going to host another one and, and nothing is going to really be done about it. I mean, we can go there. We can maybe try to shut one of them down. But there's 100 others taking place throughout the country. So until we really think about how to go about this uh, in a strategic way, it's just going to keep happening and it's just going to get worse. And, uh, you know, these Antifa people, these LARPers, where is this going, by the way? I'm trying to gauge how profane I can be. You can be as profane as you want, John Doyle. This is on my personal stuff. These people well, you're gonna get maybe, shirtless. But... Is that what's happening? No, no, no. That's for uh, only if it's going on onlyfans.com slash Andrew shows. Uh, but you know, these people <laughs> they're standing out there and they're LARPing. You've got these skinny little uh, theater kids, and they're out there and they've got these AR 15s. And what they're mm -hmm. 
doing is they have two separate groups of these Antifa of them that is being belligerent and they're getting in the faces of the counter protesters. They're pushing them, they're spitting on them, and they're just hoping that somebody retaliates, at which point an Antifa person who's armed is just going to shoot them dead in the street. Now, they have this plan, they have this set up, uh, and of course, you know, 50 or not even 50, they couldn't get that many, but you know, 15 armed Antifa people all wearing the same black block, all carrying the same types of weapons. They didn't just by happenstance or coincidence show up at this event. This was planned. This was coordinated. But according to our you know, Department of Justice, Antifa is just an idea. It's a movement. It's not actually a group, which, of course, is bullshit. But, yeah, they're literally planning on killing anybody that plans to severely disrupt uh, that type of event or even retaliate to the aggression from the left. And the right's answer is just to kind of like, you know, dunk on them and say how wrong it is and call them groomers and perverts and what have you. But we really need something uh, that has more teeth than that. Like, And even, you know, if, if there was a situation, the police don't care. I mean, there were people who were on video being spat on, being shoved, being assaulted by these people, and nothing was done about it. The police didn't do anything about it. So until we really get some sort of way to send cops into these places and arrest these people and arrest Antifa people on site under RICO, uh, you know, after we label them as domestic terrorists, which they are, and they're really the only domestic terrorists that you see in mass in this country, but we just don't have the institutional power to do that. And so in the meantime, we'll just kind of, you know, occupy our time by showing up to these events and making a big scene. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying there's eventually going to have to be something more than that. I did that back in June because I thought that that was going to be the catalyst to getting something done about that. Uh, and, you know, the footage was played on Tucker. It was viral on Twitter, but uh, it sort of fizzled out. And so we really just need, you know, some sort of planning that, that we just don't have yet. Trust the plan, as John Doyle said. One of the things, I think the title for the first video we ever had together was The Right Exists as a Vacuum to Funnel Money. Really? And that's what I'm hearing now is that there's not many people willing to do much more than show up and maybe get views and then when this legislation happens it's not backed at all and then john doyle has to show up and then somebody makes a conspiracy theory about andrew says and john doyle um but that's inside baseball for for 12 other people real Can you say something? yeah it's real i mean life. i was just gonna say that i mean these people are are, are cowards and uh i just i just hope that if it reaches a point where there's nothing else we can really do that uh just remember you know these people have names and addresses, and maybe we'll go door knocking and ask them why they're being so stupid. And if they refuse to comply, maybe we'll tickle them. That's what we'll do because we're nonviolent. We're going to tickle these people. And we're going to say, hey, if you don't pass this legislation, or maybe you don't even have another chance. You've sold us out. You've failed us. We're going to we're gonna paint your house a color that you don't want it to be painted. We're going to, oh, what's that? It's a tasteful beige. Now it's a flamingo <laughs> pink and you look ridiculous. You're going to have an HOA fine. Yeah. Use some of that lobbyist money for an HOA fine, you idiot. Oh, what's that? You're, you're, you're at the gas station because we've been telling you we're going to get, we're going to tickle you with the gas pump. You know, something like that. Uh, I'm not above so sons of anarchy remake in the works here. I think. Yeah. 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 I just think that, you know, these people need to be held accountable and, uh, I, I fantasize almost every day when I get out of bed about some like kangaroo court scenario where Tucker Carlson is filling the place of uh, Scarecrow and the Dark Knight Rises. And, uh, you know, we're just telling these, you know, just holding these people accountable because it is really uh, a disgrace to this country and to the founding stock that we've allowed things to get this bad. And uh, I, I hate weakness. I hate weak leadership. And I hate seeing this all be told to us as though it's inevitable. And at some point, I just really want to see something interesting happen, which I'm not calling for anything bad, by the way. OK, I'm just simply saying at a certain point, you know, we're going to need to tickle these people or something. I don't know. Well, throughout the lockdowns up here, I was it was really sad to see the lack of politicians. And I know we shouldn't uh expect too much from them but they were so unwilling to say lockdowns are bad forced vaccinations for your jobs are bad like two people did it and then the majority of them only came on board after the lockdowns were over and said look how much i'm standing up for you now and it's really sad to watch adult men mostly in 35 to 45 year old range be afraid of what twitter is going to say to them because the worst thing that's going to happen is they get kicked out of their party and boohoo you only have your job for a few more years getting paid a hundred grand and then you can move on and do something else that's the level of let's call it manliness that we're dealing with with a lot of these politicians who are supposed to be in the conservative party they're so afraid to you know say something that 
the CBC, the state broadcaster is going to write about them that 12 people and their grandmother will read or that Twitter will have responses about 12 people will respond on there and say that they're racist and fascist and everything. You know, Justin Trudeau can come on television and call you some sort of names, but that's only going to make you money. People, if, uh, if you understand how it works out there with Trudeau, um, he only picks on people that are popular, including myself. You know, one time, uh, during the election debates that we had, the federal election debates, we had, a call-in thing for journalists to call in and ask questions. This was the one where he refused to answer us. Um, and I got so drunk with power at one point when I realized all they were doing was a conference call. So they had all these journalists call in and they were just having them on a conference call. This is the level of intelligence, no special service or anything, one phone. And I realized that all the other journalists could hear me. And I never posted this video, but I went on a 20 minute rant about how they're all pathetic <laughs> and how they're not doing their jobs. And, and this is just the, the paper thin layer that I'm talking about between people and the government and holding them to account. And I just wish more people would say, Hey, uh, author or Hey, politician, who's, who's saying this on the day of, we expect more from you, just like you're saying. That's why whenever I'm on my show and we read an article that's like, this is why fathers should bring their sons to pride marches, or this is why chest feeding's great. You click on the author, you see what they've got going on. And most of the time, it's people that don't have anything else. They don't have the strong following. They don't have you know, their opinions all over Twitter. They're actually paid to produce this sort of crap for multiple outlets so that CNN can steal from it, Yahoo can steal from it, and post it on their own. So it's not strong individuals with strong beliefs. It's the useful idiots. And I wish people would start you know, pointing this stuff out. And it's not that difficult, especially in countries like Canada, to non-violently gain control of the narrative as long as you're not afraid of twitter and everything and that's what i got yeah to say, they uh they literally like they think they're breaking watergate but they're nothing more than <laughs> the little lap dogs for the regime i mean they're writing stories they went into journalism because they're like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna get this i'm gonna get the scoop i'm gonna be bring truth to power and they're writing stories about like joe biden eating double what is a chocolate chocolate chip or whatever or right. you know, the, the equivalent flavor. in canada like they are nothing <laughs> more than servants of an illegitimate regime which is hostile to the people over whom it governs and it's like they're the worst there's no scum in this country lower than the journalist i mean you know the elites are the elites but at least they're like kind of open about it like how sociopathic they are and how much they hate us are, are self-righteous like you know the elites claim to be you know maybe more knowledgeable but they really never come out and say like oh we're better than you in the sense of like morality the journalists really believe that they're like the arbiters of truth which is more annoying especially too because the journalists should be the ones that actually like holding these people accountable but they're not they're controlled yeah they're uh, they're scum they're literally lower than ants and they should all uh like just they just leave. They should just leave. They should just go away. I like I watching you control your your verbiage there. Um, I they all hate these people. <laughs> they I hate them because when they're writing articles and hit pieces about you, they know that they're like they're not breaking a story that's particularly interesting. Like they're not writing something. What they're doing because if it were interesting, they would reach out to you for comment, but they never do. So what they do is they they have an economy where all of their stupid little friends have written pieces about you that are all very vague, filled mm -hmm. with embellishments. And then they write a piece and they'll make an even further embellished claim about you. And then for their source for that, they cite the well, article that was written the, about yeah. their friend. And so they just keep this going. So the entire hit piece doesn't actually have a narrative. It's literally just like a mad lib of all these out of context things that they've constructed about you. And what they're doing that for is not so they can like break the story to some grandmother in South Dakota who's never heard of you. It's because they want Google, when your name is searched, mm -hmm. to come up with nothing but bad thing, bad thing, bad thing, so that the masses read that and they're just like, oh, this person's scary. Oh, I don't want to associate with him. And uh, we're just afraid of that. So that's why even, you know, these politicians, like you mentioned, they're afraid of, re you know, the article that's going to be seen by 12 people because, because what, like one of their donors is going to see it. It's like the correct answer to that is, look, are you perfect? Do you think you're perfect? No, obviously all of us are not perfect. So the question becomes, if we're all equally flawed, why is it that I'm the only one getting things written about me by the establishment media? Why are all of these people who claim to be representing you not being attacked by the media? It's because they do not view them to be a threat. They perceive them to be an ally or impotent. They are a controlled opposition, and I have contempt for them. 
Well, you see these movies. I watched one, I think, a few months ago. It was about catfishing was the predominant role of the uh, the film. But it was this girl who was a journalist in California. She worked in this 10-story building. Um, she had a huge office, her own desk. And her job was to come up with a piece once every couple weeks. You know, this job that doesn't exist probably hasn't existed since 1997, if even then. Come up with your piece and it's going to be amazing. And you get all your expenses paid. You probably make 55 grand a year um, plus all your expenses and uh and bonuses if your article does well it's like i don't know if you ever seen the movie fletch uh, from the 80s they're coming out with a remake soon chevy chase i think you'd love that movie john doyle but um it's like i'm going out on this two-week trip and i'm gonna have an amazing piece for you and it's gonna justify all my flights and my hotels and she's like she's gonna catfish this guy and it's gonna be a great story that people are gonna click on and i'm just sitting there thinking as a person involved in the media, that this doesn't exist. And this is what you're selling as a dream to young women is that they're going to get to fly across the country and become journalists who only need to submit something up once every few weeks. And as long as it's kind of good, then they're going to earn a salary. And it's not actually just going to be remote work uh, for $20 an article or five cents a word that they're actually going to have to do for Vice News, um, Now This, and Vox all at the same time. So it's an over-glamorization. And I think uh, if you go back and watch movies with keeping in mind how they present journalists and how they present them as amazing. There's another one where there's a meteor coming to towards earth. It's not uh, the Aerosmith one. It's a, an earlier one than that, but uh, they just make it so that the journalists, they've really got such a responsibility and you should trust them. And they're, su they're such great people. And this is what they've sold to young people. Just like there's one. I always remember where John Oliver said, you know, Trump said this about Sweden, and then in response, the Swedish government says, well, that's completely not true. That was, of course, about the uh, the rioting I believe they were having from their uh, Muslim refugees in Malmo with all the firebombs. But that's just what, how they present everything. They present it like this. These are experts. You can trust whatever they say. But I do think that uh, crystal ball is breaking a little bit. But it all it takes is breaking that frontier of the Snapchat with Jimmy Fallon and whoever else is on there, James Corden. And then you got Instagram coming in and this little weird bubble. They keep, they try to keep people in from birth. It's really, it's really gross and weird. And I'd hope that every person eventually gets out of it. But then again, you have like 50 year olds with a Ukraine flag on Twitter who are just like, well, you know, that's Russian propaganda. Yeah, you're absolutely right that most people's understanding of journalism is completely informed by what they see in Hollywood which is always the story of, you know, the reporter and the journalist who's who's speaking truth to power. But if you look throughout history, I mean, even as recently as the Nixon administration, he said the press is the enemy, the universities are the enemy. Write that on a chalkboard a hundred times and never forget it. And it's true. The press has always been the lapdog of the establishment. I mean, no real establishment is ever going to permit uh, without impediment, the existence of a press that is challenging its authority. I mean, I'm sorry, it's just the reality of the situation. And so, yeah, our you know journalism and press and media establishment all exist to serve the you know post-war neoliberal regime, the globalist American empire, the gay, and any outlet that tries to seriously establish or uh, challenge its power is going to be destroyed. Uh, I mean, even, you know, the go-to conservative outlet in America, Fox News, you know, they've got a really good guy on there named Tucker Carlson, who I'm, I mean, he is just so on point. It is a miracle to me. Uh, but ultimately, you know, the rhetoric in terms of like, if you had to put bullet points for the sentiment that that outlet is espousing, it's ultimately not threatening. You know, maybe its views are on the fringe of the paradigm, but ultimately they're not really transcending that paradigm or breaking through it. Um, and so a lot of times, yeah, what we're hearing is, is you know, ultimately, but it gives the illusion of being something that's new or something that's, you know, actually challenging, but it's ultimately not. It's just something that's, uh, you know, the same old stuff with maybe a new, a new skin on it. All right. We'll take off John Doyle. Stop spreading propaganda for, uh, what's a good no. name? Adam Schiff. If you know, I will not. Well, Stop no, 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 treading no, no, no. Water for Hirono, whatever her first name is. I am, uh, I'm not spreading propaganda for Adam Schiff. Uh, I'm spreading propaganda for the greatest American currently alive, Donald John Trump. He's my hero. I'm his top guy, and uh, I will continue <laughs> to do that, actually. I expect my ambassador for, of Canada to the United States rule to be fulfilled in, under the John Doyle oh, government. Oh, believe me, I understand that politics is about punishing my enemies and rewarding my friends. You will have mm. that job sooner than you think. <laughs>